How many of you have read Small is Beautiful? Honestly, apparently this is one of those books that people put their hands up because they think they've read it or because they should have read it. How many people have read Small is Beautiful? Uh, I've, I've been rereading this this week and it is staggering, uh, reading particularly the education section. Uh, it is just, uh, the, the, it is so current, up to date, it could have been re written last week. It's just so on the ball. Um, this is the 25th anniversary edition with commentaries. I just want to read one of the commentaries from the great US educator David Orr. Anybody worked with David Orr? Yeah. So he says, most people now associate Schumacher's name with problems of economics and small scale and scale of technology, not with education. But the most incandescent pages in the book have to do with education because there he probed the origins, origins of the crisis. All of the rest he regarded as symptoms arising from a disorder in our basic convictions propagated by formal education. Really strong statement. And um, um, having spent a couple of decades at the nexus of technology and, and um, uh, small-scale technology and economics working in Africa and South Asia, so really coming from the world of economics and, and appropriate technology, in retrospect, I think he's absolutely right. I think this is the critical chapter in the book, is the one in education. Uh, and I want to explain a little bit about why I think that's the case. And to then focus on the work of Schumacher College, or to, to look at the kind of radical pedagogy that is not just unique to Schumacher College, but I think we're really pioneering as a way of changing the pedagogical ethic in ways that I think Schumacher would really have improved on. So um, Schumacher, he, he, he was often quite, um, I think he was a strong Christian. He was often quite biblical in his language. And one of the, the critical bits in, the, in the, the chapter in education is where he talks about the sins of the fathers being um, arriving landing in the third and fourth generations. And he really used this strongly when talking about education, saying that, the, that fundamentally the, the people who initiate, who are the originators of ideas and paradigms, rarely see the paradigms fully realized and matured in their own time. It's more that in three or four generations' time, that's when it really lands and it becomes so much the dominant story within which we understand and interpret the world that we don't even realize it's a story. So he was looking back to the Victorian era, particularly uh, the world of Malthus and uh, uh, Charles Darwin, the whole materialist revolution. In fact, I think he, he could really have looked back some centuries further to the Enlightenment, but he was really saying that the worldview that we currently in, inherit, that, that we currently inhabit at the moment, is that that was created in the Victorian era. So we live, the, the, the stories, the language, the the, the, the way that we make sense of reality is profoundly influenced by the thinking of, I think, post-enlightenment, but particularly by the great Victorian evolu social evolutionary theorists. So, this is, has, has um, it means that the, the dominant story that we're living within is one in which that legacy has really played out. So, the story being, and this is an incredible story, um, in terms of, uh, it's a story that would not be recognized by most eras of history. The story that is generated is one in which the only source of intelligence in an otherwise inanimate planet is human intellect. So, and that this is generated at a level of abstraction, and certainly in the field of economics, we speak of ecosystem services, we speak of the environment, we speak of nature, we speak of natural resource as being something outside of ourselves which we manipulate, dissect for our own benefit as a sole species on the planet that has rationality, meaning, sentience, consciousness. Now just to repeat, this is an extraordinary worldview. It's a worldview that we you know, as inheritors, the children of the third and fourth generation, it's kind of, we, we take it for granted. But if we look at the long sweep of human history, it is an extraordinary story. And this, I think, it was so, like, 
for Fritz Schumacher to have spotted this and put it at the center of his book. How many years ago? 25, 30 years ago, I think it's extraordinary. The, the, the critical importance of this insight. And somebody who we have at the college quite a lot is a guy called David Abraham. And um, he, he wrote a wonderful book called The Spell of the Sensuous. And he, he remarks that, um, that for pre-literate people, the word psyche was used to denote not, and I say the word psyche, I almost by impulse point to the left side of my brain, but actually the word psyche was used to understand the air, the invisible element through which all beings, stones, rocks, mountains, rivers, have communion. I mean, again, I, I really tried to just anchor myself into the worldview of someone, most of human history, that would have the belief that intelligence, mystery, sentience is located in the air in which all beings, animate and inanimate, have communion. So this is the majority view in terms of the long thread of human history. So Schumacher again points to uh, the difference between convergent and divergent thinking. So convergent thinking being those problems which are capable of scientific analysis, rational, like problems that can be solved through scientific methods. And divergent problems being those which are much more in the realm of the, they're, they're really the human story and the humanities and social sciences where intuition, intelligence, emotional intelligence, bodily intelligence is required to transcend the apparent incompatibility of opposites, to create a synthesis that is greater, like, that, that calls on an emergent field of intelligence to address problems that would otherwise not be solved. And again, Schumacher points to the um, uh, he, he points to the that the part of our legacy as the children as children of the Enlightenment, particularly of the Victorian era, that the the deep belief is that all problems are convergent. So consciousness is seen as being well, that's merely subjective. So therefore, of no scientific value. So it's kind of wiping out all of the felt subjective experience and limiting the realm of respectable science and academia to that which can be dissected and rationally solved. And for, for Schumacher, this was the root of the problem. Um, and the root of the problem being a conflict between the human heart and the human intellect. So the heart knowing that the subjective is critically important, but the intellect living within this dominant societal story, but unless it's scientifically provable, it is no validity. You with me so far? Okay. So Schumacher wrote, this is from the chapter on education, the leading ideas of the 19th century which claim to do away with metaphysics are themselves a bad, vicious, life-destroying type of metaphysics. We are suffering from them as from a fatal disease. It is not even true that metaphysics and ethics would be eliminated. On the contrary, all we got was bad metaphysics and appalling ethics. <laughs> Brilliant. So the question then is how do we, like, and, and noticing the role of pedagogy, what happens in the classroom and deeply enforcing this worldview, this extraordinary worldview that we are separate from the rest of creation as the sole source of meaning and intelligence in an otherwise meaningless, empty, inanimate, mechanical world that is driven purely by sexual selection and avoiding being gobbled up. So I mean, the most extreme manifestation of this was Descartes, one of the, the great founders of the uh, Enlightenment uh, ways of thinking, who advised his vivisection students that the screams of the animals that they could hear while they were cutting them open were not pain and sentience, because these were mechanical creatures, but rather it was the crunching of the gears as they actually opened up the bodies. Now this is, this is our lineage. This is where we're sitting. A very extreme expression of our, of our lineage, but this is the root of the lineage that we are effectively living in an inanimate mechanical universe that can, that can only be 
legitimately understood and analyzed through rational left brain thinking. So, how can we how can we look to the third and fourth generations to come and begin to lay the foundation, plant the seeds for different ways of thinking? And effectively, that's what we're doing at Schumacher College and a number of other places like Findhorn and other centers of education that have been working with. Um, I want to share three, three different ways that we're working. One, which again, Schumacher really focuses in on in this chapter, is the use of language. Is noticing how, so I, I, by way of example, I used to work in a field and I struggled to say the word because of its toxicity. The field is development. So I worked in development for a few decades. And the language and the narratives that we use, so defining wealth purely in terms of income, first world, second world, third world, underdevelopment, the whole language leads us inexorably to the point where we are at the moment. Sorry, that's where we are. So it is the language that imprisons us in, in our current ways of thinking. And um, there are whole other vocabularies potentially open to us. Now I'm looking at Helen at the back who's done a lot of work in exactly this field that, that would describe the beautiful, exquisite human cultural adaptation to the specificity of place, a mosaic of different cultures that are beautifully attuned to the culture, to the topographical, to, to, the, to the specificity of the old place they're living in. This is a whole other language which we're not using and currently in consequence the diversity of human condition is steamrolled into the one-size-fits-all materialist income, defining wealth by income system that we currently have. So, it's something we play with at the college. We had uh, Robert Chambers was a, is an eminent, um, really the grandfather of participatory uh, techniques in the field of development. We brought him along and said, you can't use the word development. There were a number of other words he wasn't allowed to use. <laughs> so it's really, it's going to be clunky, it's going to be difficult at the beginning, but really think through what are we, what are we really talking about here? And similarly, we get David Boyle along to talk about um, money systems. He could use the word money. So again, we really have to move beyond the abstract category boxes into really diving deep. And whole new territories emerge that we hadn't previously seen because the language was obscuring the range of the possible. Something, going back to Adam's talk this morning, something I'm really enjoying is um, the, like, for those of you under the age of about 30, this might be an extraordinary thing to learn, but like words like hackerspaces, peer-to-peer, crowdfunding, couchsurfing, like a whole range of words associated with the emergence of the commons hadn't been framed. And what has happened over the last decade or so is there's been this great linguistic explosion of linguistic fertility that both reflects the nature of the emerging future, but also creates more conceptual and linguistic space for it to expand into as we begin to have a language that enables us to see things that previously we simply haven't seen because we didn't have words for them. And it's something I really love in the college during the course of the, uh, we have students that are in four master's programs, and certainly in the economics program, increasingly through the course of the year, they're interrupting themselves. So they're in, they're saying something, going, oh, that's not the right word, that's not the right word, and really searching for what the right word might be, and being encouraged to create words, to open the conceptual linguistic space for different ways of doing things to become, to reveal themselves. So, first area is playing, like, Playing with linguistic creativity. A second area is very consciously inviting the emotions, the body, the intuition into the classroom. So seeing these as legitimate sources of intelligence and information and really encouraging our students to express themselves artistically, even in the economic classroom, theater, painting. Um, and this is very much about, just again, one example is I noticed that working with ecological footprinting has been mentioned earlier, working with ecological footprinting, but as long as we said on the conceptual level, not much happens. So students leave with more facts that become a source for, a source of clever after-dinner anecdotes, 
But in terms of deep transformation, very little transformation. Um, but create on the on your village green. We start working with four circles, like one circle representing a North American footprint. If the average North American, if everyone on the planet had the lifestyle of the average North American, we'd need five planets. So one circle, fingertip to fingertip. The next circle, the Western European circle, three planets worth. Again, generous but not quite so extreme. Uh, a third circle representing transition countries, maybe Central America, uh, more cramped. And the fourth circle representing Africa, South India, just simply a cluster of bodies. And inviting the students just to watch, just to see what is their intuitive bodily response to watching this happen. And immediately, catharsis, emotions engaged, intuition engaged, and a much more powerful transformative experience. So something we play with a lot is techniques for building physical constellations so the students, rather than standing outside of systems, analyzing them, can actually be participation, participants within them. And again, inviting them to seek, to seek empathic identification with, with other actors in the system who don't have a voice. So seek empathic identification with other species that are affected, with unborn children, with poor people on the other side of the world, speaking not about them, but from their perspective. A third area is recognizing, certainly in the field of economics, the need for not just an outer journey of transition, but an inner journey of transition. So the importance of, can, can, if we look at linking this to the question of language, the word economy we tend to see as being this, it kind of represents this thing out there that does stuff to us that we generally don't like. It's kind of the economy. But again, if you drop the word economy and really reflect, allow the phenomenon to reveal itself, it reveals itself as a matrix of billions of interactions and transactions occurring daily in which we are deeply embedded. So it's not this thing out there, it's something in which we are already deeply embedded. One of the great insights that Schumacher came back from Burma with was that science in the West, or economics in the West is defined as the science of scarcity on the assumption that the demand for goods will always exceed the supply. Whereas he, what he observed in, in Burma was that the cultivated woman and man would seek abundance not through consumption but by reducing their needs. So a deep study into the nature of desire and its relation to the economy. <coughs> now, this is not to it's not to suggest that, I mean, there are parts of the world that would do very well by having a higher material standard of living, clearly. It's also not to deny the fact that there are power structures within the system that have disproportionate leverage and prevent us from effecting the kind of changes that are urgently needed. But it does point to the importance of an inner exploration of bringing values into alignment with behavior to affect those changes in the system in which we are embedded that we can. Yeah, I, and with those who are current or potential future students at Schumacher College, please reveal themselves. So I would, uh, I would suggest that among the students that we have at the college, that, that while they do learn new theories and models, that consistently the most important feedback is the experience of having lived, having beaten the new economy, of having moved beyond simply thinking about and understanding, and actually having immersed themselves within a living context, which is geared around consciousness, relationship, and self-reflection, and creating structures within the system that means that we're not just thinking of five, but we're actually trying to realize within the college campus, the college community. So just to sum up, I, it seems to me that, um, uh, that, that uh, increasingly we're working, I'm particularly interested, I've been working for the last couple of years with students in the law faculty at Queen's University Belfast, bringing Schumacher College type ways of working with them, 
very conservative faculty in a very conservative university in a very conservative part of the world. I should know I'm from there. Um, and at the end of a week, they're, they're like, it feels like a desert where it's just raining for the first time in five years. They deeply get it. With the hunger among both faculty and students for a much more consciously whole person education that is seeking to bring literally the classroom back into life, into a living relationship with the rest of the world. There's a real hunger for it, and it seems to me that it's not too fanciful to imagine that we are doing today what the Victorians did a couple of hundred years ago and generating the platforms that third and fourth generations to come will be able to stand proud of. Thank you.